Hi. Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me. My name is Bande Dalol. I'm one of the stroke physicians. Um, it's not really a great time probably to lecture you. <laughs> <laughs> it's only 23 slides probably between you and the neurosurgeons, so I'm sure you'll be asleep by then. <laughs> and then it won't be long before you're in bed. So I'll try to go through quickly. Um, it's actually interesting talking about stroke because, I mean, let's face it, if you're a neurosurgeon, you would know by now. If you're a neurologist, you would probably have a good idea. If you're a GP, you probably would have decided this. It's either you're a physician or a surgeon. Stroke medicine, not many people know about stroke medicine. Is it neurology? Is it medicine? Is it neuroradiology? And actually, the true, an the true answer is all of this all together, really. It's a new specialty. It's not been there for very long. So historically, it was under geriatrics. So the geriatricians would look after stroke pa patients. But before that, it was actually under the neurologists. So neurologists would look after stroke patients. Well, it's a, it's a no-brainer. If you, if you have a stroke, it's in the brain, and the neurologist should look after you. And it's a great way to make a diagnosis. But how to treat stroke, it's how to treat a heart attack. You need to know about blood pressure, you need to know about uh, antiplatelet medications, the cardiovascular risk, and I'm not sure actually neurologists would be the best place for that. So if you want to make a diagnosis, neurology would be great. If you want to treat stroke physician, geriatricians would be great. But what you really need is a stroke physician. And this is when in 2007, it kind of came an idea, you know, let's, let's come up with a, 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 a new specialty that will actually kind of bring these two together. So you are a bit of a neurologist and a bit of a physician and you match your skills. In, from 2010, there is a stroke specialty and it's changing all the time. So you would do it's not a specialty on its own now, so there is no training in stroke per se when you finish the training. And we, we will come quickly to that. So you will do um, uh, a bit of medicine and then an extra year to do stroke. But in the future, it will be from the foundation, from the foundation years, you'll be doing just stroke. Just stroke, exactly the same way cardiologist has come up. So now cardiologists, they never used to use uh, intervention, but now, uh, you wouldn't hear of cardiothoracic sur surgeon because lots of the things they do, cardiologists do. And this is what will be happening in stroke. So it's a pretty exciting. And nobody can tell you now how will it look in five or ten years' time. You will find out. But you need to have an interest first. And this is what I need to convince you, that you need to be a stroke physician to make a difference. And this is why. I'm going to start my presentation with cases. Yeah? To show you that you, this is the reason why you need to be a stroke physician. So case one, 84 years old, came with a, I'm going to try to work this out. Is this the, uh, the laser? I believe so, yes. Yeah, there we go. So uh, this patient came a couple of years ago with, you can see the thrombus. You do not need uh, a new radiology to show that. You know, so and this is the beautiful thing about stroke. It's really, really easy. It's really easy. There's not much into it. You can see how this is hyper dense, lighting up, and this is not. This is a thrombus there, and you can, you know this because the patient comes with weakness in one side. How clever do you have to be? It's really, I mean, <laughs> patient going like this. Of course, it's gonna have strokes. So you, you're gonna do a CT scan to make sure that's not bleeding because you're not, you know, in the end you still have to apply a bit of common sense. So the CT scan comes with a thrombus there. What do you do? You burst the clot. And this is what the cardiologists used to do. You have a patient with a heart attack, you give them thrombolysis, you burst the clot, problem sorted. And this is exactly what happened with this gentleman. He came with a clot, and then the clot is, is gone. This man's life being saved. You have done that as a stroke physician. It's the fastest treatment. This is what orthopedics, medicine, do, you know, orthopedic sur surgery are very proud of. Patient would come in a wheelchair. The next day, will go out walking. 
it's the fastest result. It's the most satisfying. You cannot believe how satisfying it is. This patient came with very severe weakness, not able to talk, not able to walk, and within one hour, he was able to talk. The weakness is gone. And this is what you have done by making a diagnosis and looking clever. There's nothing clever about it. It's just all common sense. It's so easy. And this is why stroke medicine is what you want to do. It's really, really easy. <laughs> so case two, 84 female this time, known to have aortic stenosis, came around that time, had a CT head. Within five, five minutes, you can have a CT head. You do not wait for the report because how difficult it is to diagnose this. <laughs> There's a clot there. Then what do you do? You give thrombolysis. Now, you know the clot there is about one centimeter. It's, thrombolysis is not likely to work. The clot passage is not likely to work. But you do give that. You wait for the hour and the patient cannot walk, cannot talk, really severely disabled. She's 84. Now, you do a CTA for the patient to have impelectomy. Who makes that decision? Not the neuroradiologist, not the neurosurgeon. <laughs> it's you. The patient is in front of you. He's your patient. She's your patient. Weakness, you give thrombolysis, not work. What would you do? You make, a, you make an assessment. You need to see what's the comorbidity of this patient. What's the pre-morbid status? And it's all common sense. This is the reason real doctors are G G GPs, because they have the most common sense. It's, it's the reason why you went into medicine, isn't it? General medicine is the reason why you went into medicine. But unless if you knew you were a neurosurgeon, you wouldn't be here because you knew that. You didn't want people to convince you to become neurosurgeons. Anyway, this patient goes to Queen Elizabeth Hospital. Within the hour, went there. You can see there's no blood there. You can see this is the dye, okay? You give a contrast. You can see the contrast here. You see it there. The contrast is not there. Do you need a neuroradiologist to show that? <laughs> no. Then, what the neurointerventionist, now the question is, who would do this procedure? The cardiologist. Do not ask neurointerventionists to put a catheter to retrieve the clot from the heart. And in the future, it will be you. The cardiologists who are doing that now, not neurointerventionists. And this is where the debate is. Who is the best person to take that clot out? Could, it, could be, it could be stroke physician. It could be still cardiologist, because they're already halfway there. You just need to have a, a longer catheter, and they're already there. <laughs> Neuroradiologist. Can you actually believe that? I mean, neurologists can barely satisfy the neurosurgeons to actually satisfy the stroke physicians. Within minutes, you can see the dye there. Problem sorted. This patient, this is, this is the whole outcome. This patient would have never been able to talk, would have never been able to walk. Within a couple of hours, this is the only damage. She went home, independent, not using a walking stick, nothing. Not only that, she had to stay in ITU. What for? because she developed aspiration pneumonia. Who can treat aspiration pneumonia? Not a neurologist, not a neurosurgeon. You need a physician. And this is the reason neurosciences, it's not about head up, it's about the whole body. And this is why stroke medicine comes. You need, some, you need to be a physician first to become a stroke physician. A physician first, before, because what's from the head up, you do not need to know much. You do not need to be as clever as a neurosurgeon or a neurologist. It's so easy. This is all what you need to do, and you are there. Not only that, it's pretty fun. It's really, really fun. <laughs> right, look at case three. And, and here I make my case, okay? 71 years old man. Came a few, few a couple of weeks ago. Right, right-sided weak, weakness, not able to walk. Not able to talk. Really easy. What's the diagnosis? Stroke. Have a CT head. What can you see? How much did you learn stroke? How, how much did you study about stroke? Maybe in the last five minutes. Can, can you see that? You already know it. 
You already know. So there's a clot there. So as a stroke physician, what, what would you be? You would make an assessment to make sure that, you, you know, you're not harming this patient. You give thrombolysis. Thrombolysis does not work. Oh, it's four o'clock. There is no thrombectomy at four o'clock. It's the end of the day. Now look, 16 hours later, six hours from there, the patient dies. You could save him. This is the reason why you need to be a stroke sort of physician. These patients shouldn't die. He shouldn't die. You know, you know, you need three years, three years only, to know how to stick a catheter in to remove that clot. That patient life would have been saved. Quick fix. We cannot do it because not many people are interested in doing it. Another reason why you need to be stroke physicians. This is how many strokes per year. Second cause of death. You went to medicine. Cliche, fair enough. But this is why you went to medicine. To see what's the biggest killer and try and, and save lives. This is why you went to medicine. This is the second cause of death. How many of you wants to be a stroke physician? None. <laughs> How many of you wants to be a neuroradiologist, a, a, a G, GP, neuro, neurologist, neurosurgeon? All of you. Yet, we're missing the point. It's the second most cause of death. Don't ask me about the first. I'm not here to talk about the first cause of death. Ask me about this. Twice as much women die from stroke than breast cancer. You didn't know that. And more men than prostate and testicular cancer took together. It's a, it's a bigger killer. This is how much you spend on every living cancer patient. Yet, you spend a fraction of that for stroke survivors. It's a bigger killer. Why are we not seeing the bigger picture here? Evidence-based. You need to treat 18 patients not treat them, just put them in a stroke unit with a stroke consultant, not a neurologist, not a geriatrician, not a neuroradiologist, certainly not a neurosurgeon. You need a, neurose you need a, you need a stroke physician. You need to treat 18, 18 patients to save one, one patient life, independent. They would be going home independent. Not only that, This is about the team, but look at this. You need to treat five patients with thrombolysis within one and a half hours. Five patients. To one of them will be alive, independent living. How many do you need to have a PCI? How many PCIs do you need to do to save one patient? Evidence based. 33. 33. Number need to treat 33. Number need to treat five from one and a half hours a bit more, nine. More than that, 19. Can you see? Brain is time. You present in the accident emergency department in the resource room before the patient arrives, you know you save millions of cells, you know you're saving lives. Why wouldn't you do want to do that? Better. Even better, you think, okay, fine, I'm doing a great job. Well, I'm not. Because as you can see, from the cases that you've seen, two patients were saved, one, one wasn't because of the impilectomy. Look, look at that. You need to treat three. Three patients, one of them will be alive, in, independent. Number needed. Give me anything in medicine that you, you will try that will have number needed to treat of three. Not much, not that I know. What do you need to do? This is where you need to invest your time. This is, this could be your family, anybody, isn't it? But that's what you need to, to do, really. Right, stroke comes with blood pressure. You're not going to ask a 
a neurologist and a neurosurgeon how to treat blood pressure, you need to be a physician. And this is really what stroke is all about. You need to read ECGs. You need to read imaging. You need to know how to treat blood pressure. You need to be a bit of a neurologist. You certainly need to be a general practitioner. I mean, general practitioners, this is what they do. They refer patients to us on treatment. We do not, we're not need, needed here. Can you please see this patient, suspected TIA, or suspected stroke? Great. What have you done as a GP? Well, I've just put them on antiplatelets. I've treated their cholesterol. I've treated their blood pressure. My, I'm, I become redundant, really. And, and this is really what you need to be. You need to be a physician. All what I need to do is an admin work. Request that CT to go to the radiology department to make sure that it's not a bleeding. I'll say, yeah, thumb up. You admitted that you've started this perfect. But, if it, but what if it wasn't a TIA? What if it was a migraine? What if it was an MS? What if it was something else? So this is when stroke physicians come. You need to know a lot of neurology, a lot of stroke mimics to be able. What if it was a presyncope? What if it was a syncope? You need to be a cardiologist to, to do that. Basically, you need to be a physician. This is what you have been already doing. Right. Typical week. There isn't really. It's too much fun. So much variation in it. This is what I'm going to do. In the next few years, they're going to open training program to become interventionist. I might be, I might not be interested. I might not be a bit of a surgeon. I might, might be interested to spend my time in resource delivering the thrombolysis and deciding which patient, it's you, deciding which patient needs to have thrombectomy. In 10 years from now, I might actually, you know what? I do not want to be a resource. I'm a bit slower. I'm a bit lazier. I want to teach. I want to stay behind. I'll go to look after patients on the ward, still on the ward. There's an acute stroke. There's re re rehabilitation. You cannot do stroke without re rehabilitation. I want to do a bit of te teaching. It's very, very variable. You can do a lot of things in stroke. This is the reason why it's really, it's, it's the best specialty, as simple as that. If you want to be in hospital medicine, this is what you need to consider doing, okay? We do rotational patterns. So we do TIA clinics. We do stroke follow-up clinics. There's rehabilitation clinic and spastistic clinic to give injections for, to release the muscles. Uh, there is ward work. There is acute on call work. Uh, there is teaching work. And that's it. So if, every week is there is something different. You never get bored. It's never repetitive. Why stroke? Because it's just so simple, so easy. <laughs> it's the easiest diagnosis that you cannot make. The diagnosis already made for you before the patient comes to the hospital. All what you need to facilitate the patient walking the next day. It's got great potential. You could be the one doing the intervention if you want to. It doesn't have to be a new radio radiologist. It doesn't have to be the cardiologist. And this is what we think that with the, sh the shaping of training will do really. They will make a training program for stroke, probably three to four years, where you will have a bit of neuroradiology intervention to learn only that, not to learn how to fix aneurysms or coil, nothing like that, just simply to, re to retrieve. Already there are training programs in Canada and Europe. For one year, you could go there, fellowship year, where you will do a certain number of procedures and come back interventionist. This is how, how, how easy it is. But we need people to do the job. It's adaptable to your circumstances. What, you want part-time? Absolutely great, you know? I, I do not do nights. I do not do on call nights. Work from nine to five. There is an on call if you want to. You don't have to. But this is what this is what we went to medicine. My background is geriatrics. I, I'm a geriatrics trainee, and and I, and I loved it. However, I knew I wanted to do stroke from the minute we I was in medical school when we went to the new, to the neurology ward and I saw a patient very very kind of very de de disabled, not able to walk, uh, not able to talk, very paralyzed on the right side. And I thought this is pretty scary stuff. How do you talk to this patient? What if he gets ill? How can he, how can he com communicate? 
you feel you're dealing with something very, very scary, very, very hard. How can you, how do you examine them? And I thought, you know what, actually, this is what I want to do. I want to come to this patient and be able to help them. And from that moment, I knew this is what I wanted to do. What do you want to do to make it easier for you to become a stroke physician? You want to request placement. You want to say, can I, can, can I have spent some time in stroke, on stroke wards? Come and come and visit us. It's ward 41 on the neurosciences. It's an, the, the stroke department has been there only for one year. It was part of neurology and some of it in geriatrics. So patients will have a diagnosis and then they, after 72 hours, they will be moved to the geriatrics department where at that time they would have had a chest infection. The geriatricians would treat that. And spasticity, the geriatricians would treat that and so on. But then we think that doesn't make sense. We need somebody with skills, clinical medical skills, physicians, yet a bit of a neurology in there. And this is what the stroke department has come. So there's a stroke department, Ward 41. Come and visit us and see. Look for you for yourself. Audit, project research, it will be a great way to get you there. Stroke conferences, training weekends, they're all over the place and they're free. The, the training weekends you can just attend, just to, to, to have a taste of that. You need to be a physician. If you're not a physician, you cannot be a stroke physician, as simple as that. This is the training, how it is now. The shape of training changes all the time, so I'm not going to bother you how, how it will be in the future. This is how it is now. It's unlikely to change great deal. So you need to do what, you, what you're already doing, foundation years, and then to become a surgeon up there, that, well, that will take you to the neurosurgery, or to become a GP, or to become a hospital doctor with core training, and then subspecialty. You could be training in ge geriatrics, neurology, acute medicine, neuro rehab, or clinical pharmacology. If you do any of these, you do one extra year as a stroke fellow to have a CCT in stroke. That's all what you need to do. So if you do not want to be doing nights, doing weekends, you become a clinical pharmacologist. You become neuro rehab, or you can do acute medicine if you want, or neurology. You need one extra year to your training. So it's five years. Acute medicine, you only do four years, and then one extra year stroke fellowship, and that will give you CCT and stroke. You, you, you are stroke physicians. It's quite unpredictable, really. It changes all the time. It's a new thing. It's exciting. It's really exciting. You can have a say of how is this going to be in the future. It's, it's you that will decide, really. It can be busy. Well, if you like to work alone, actually, it's not for you. Because really, as a stroke physician, it's where we make a diagnosis, we start treatment, but actually, after, after patients suffering from stroke, they do not need us, really. They need physiotherapy, they need occupation therapy, they need speech and language therapy. So it's pretty much multidisciplinary work. And you will love it. You will love it working with team. You see them every day. You work with them. They're like your friends. <coughs> I love going to work because there's a ball drawn every day. I never get sick of it. You just have a chat. It's just so easy and so fun, really. It can be emotionally drained, especially when you see patients that you cannot save just because of one hour different or because of geographical variation. And then you think, huh, if this patient went to this hospital, he would have had the treatment. Now, this is what you need to think about, really. Probably the best way you can get a career or you can, a typical day in stroke department, there's a BMJ um, a link, probably, yeah, I think I put it there. These, these three links will take you exactly there, the typical day of a stroke re registrar. It's pretty variable, it's pretty fun, it's pretty easy, really. So if you do not want to look at books all the time, become stroke physicians, it's really, really easy. And this is probably the best description of stroke medicine that I found. It provides a challenging and rewarding career with constant variety and intellectual stimulation. I leave you with that. Any questions?
as a UX only for a year. How, what proportion of hospitals actually have a stroke medicine? Most hospitals do. Uh, for example, in Queen Elizabeth, it's looked after by the geriatrician and the neurologist. So there's a, it's a shared daughter, which kind of makes sense, really. Uh, Sandwell is the same, Wolverhampton, uh, George Eliot. Uh, most hospitals looked after by the geriatricians. So geriatricians are becoming the stroke physicians. But really, for a stroke physician, you need to be a stroke physician. You need to be a geriatrician and something else. And from you know what, what I do now, I really do not do only stroke. I do stroke and a bit of acute medicine. So we do shifts there to keep the clinical skills. Although it's medicine, but it's restricted medicine. If you want to see PEs, if you want to see some kind of the medicine that you 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 be learning, you can do some extra things with it, uh, and and that's why it's quite variable. And we're you know as a geriatrician, you would be. CCT in geriatrics, CCT in general internal medicine, acute medicine, and CCT in stroke if you want to be a stroke physician. Really. So to answer your questions, most of them will have stroke department. Only in the UCW, it's, uh, it's, it's just been developing now. And actually, we are four consultants. One, two of us are new neuro neurologists, and two of us are geriatrics background. Uh, but we are a great team, and, 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 but we only do stroke. Even the neurologist has actually come off the neurology world and just doing stroke. And, Lovely. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much.